A guilty verdict in the April Jones murder trial. We are relieved that Mark Bridger has today been found guilty of the murder of our beautiful daughter, April. April will be forever in our hearts, and we are so moved by the overwhelming support we have had from so many people from all over the world. The latest on the Woolwich terror attack, we speak to the Met's specialist firearms team. The officers in our armed response vehicles have a split second to make the decision to use force or not. The hunt for a dangerous predator, targeting lone women at petrol stations. No. As soon as I saw the knife, Drive. I thought he was going to kill me. And cracking down on the mobile phone robbers, we're out on raids and arrests across the UK as the police fight back. I forgot we're surprised we have a word. This is Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next hour with this month's latest crime news and appeals, including the murder of 82-year-old grandfather Mohammed Salim in Birmingham. He was attacked from behind and stabbed brutally. There was no way he could defend himself. And former policeman Martin Bayfield is here again with more wanted faces and CCTV. Yes, we really need your help to track down this lot, which includes a delightful pair of drug dealers. David Terence Hewson and Liam Mark Johnson are particularly dangerous, so call 999 now if you know where they are. And I've some unbelievable CCTV to show you, including this guy who tried to rob a book he's armed with. Yes, that's right, a plank of wood. But we begin with the April Jones case. Today, Mark Bridger was told he would spend the rest of his life behind bars for murdering the five-year-old. Following the sentencing, April's parents, Coral and Paul, gave a statement outside Mould Crime Court. We are relieved that Mark Bridger has today been found guilty of the murder of our beautiful daughter, April. April will be forever in our hearts and we are so moved by the overwhelming support we have had from so many people from all over the world. April went missing from outside her Machantleth home on October the 1st last year. It was April's mother, Coral, who made the first 999 call, alerting police that her daughter was missing. Right, this emergency. <laughs> it sparked the largest police search in UK history assisted by hundreds of volunteers. But despite their efforts, her body has never been found. It was a seven-year-old friend of April who gave police the key evidence that she had seen her getting into Mark Bridger's Land Rover. Following the 47-year-old's arrest, April's blood was found in various locations around his house, and human bone fragments were found inside his fire. Bridger claimed he panicked after knocking April over with his car and couldn't remember what he had done with her body. But the jury didn't believe him. Well, earlier I spoke to the lead officer in charge of the case, Detective Superintendent Andrew John. Andrew, if I can ask you first of all what your personal reaction is to today's verdict. Well, obviously, I'm extremely delighted by the outcome uh, and the fact that uh, Mark Bridger has been found guilty of all offences charged. You know, my hope now is that we'll go some way to bring some form of closure for the, for the family of, of April Jones, given the uh, horrific circumstances that they've found themselves in. Um, I think today's verdict also demonstrates the the professionalism and the of the all the staff involved in the investigation. I think we've conducted the most thorough and intense investigation and I think that's demonstrated in the outcome today. In terms of an extra layer of difficulty and complication uh, for your team, wh what did it mean not being able to find her body? Clearly the, there is always that unanswered question and, and it, that, you know, attached to that is some frustration. Um, my only hope is, is that Mark Bridger will uh, one day and in the very near future uh, decide to disclose to April's parents what he's actually done with their daughter. 
Any murder investigation, of course, has at its very heart a great personal tragedy. I'm wondering, though, especially because you and your team w were searching, first of all, for a little five-year-old girl and then for her body as the investigation moved on, what personal impact did it have on you and your team? This inquiry has touched the hearts of so many people across, across the world. And, you know, from an investigation team perspective, those, you know, who have been very close to the family and, and have been involved in the inquiry, you know, many officers have their own, obviously have their own families, many are fathers or, or mothers or, or, or related to children. And, and clearly that, you know, there that comes with that a lot of, a lot of distress and anxiety. But, but, you know, to be fair to all staff involved, they remain professional throughout. Inevitably, I imagine throughout this investigation, you've spent a lot of time with little April's parents, Paul and Coral uh, Jones. C can you tell me how they are this evening? You know, they, they have got some form of relief in that uh, Mark Bridger has been found guilty and uh, knowing that, you know, he will never be released from prison has certainly gone some way to, 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 to bring some closure for them. But clearly, you know, they, 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 they leave court today still not knowing where, where their daughter is. I don't think the vast majority of the public could ever begin to imagine what, what this family has been through and indeed continue to go through. Right, we go to Woolwich now. Earlier today, 22-year-old Michael Adabawali from Greenwich in London appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court after being charged with drummer Lee Rigby's murder. A second man, Michael Adabalajo, who's 28, remains under arrest at a London hospital. It is just over a week now since Lee Rigby was murdered in front of dozens of onlookers on a South London street. The barbaric murder of a soldier on a busy London street in broad daylight was profoundly shocking. The level of violence used was extreme, but the manner of Lee Rigby's death also marked a new kind of terror attack. The murder happened at 2.20 p.m. on Wednesday the 22nd of May. Lee was brutally attacked with machetes and knives his body dragged into the road. At 2.33 p.m., three firearms officers arrived at the scene in an armed response vehicle. One of the suspects came within inches of the police car. Two officers fired shots, another a taser. The suspects, 28-year-old Michael Adebalajo and 22-year-old Michael Adeboale, were taken to hospital with gunshot injuries. They were both arrested on suspicion of murder. The killings and the subsequent police shooting played out in full gaze of the public. They were rare images of firearms officers in action. We've been given access to the headquarters of the Met's specialist firearms unit. Uh, this is one of the Met's armed response vehicles, uh, as used by SCO 19. It would have been one of these vehicles that attended the uh, incident in Woolwich last week. Um, what you have here, Matthew, is a uh, range of kit that is carried in one of our vehicles. Uh, and you'll see in front of you here uh, some of the weaponry that we carry. So when your unit is deployed, explain to me the rules of engagement. Well, usually officers in our armed response vehicles have a split second to make the decision to use force or not. Uh, and they will assess the threat that's presented to them uh, and make a personal judgment on the level of force that they're facing and decide whether to shoot or not. Give me an idea of the psychological impact when they have to fire, when they have to shoot somebody. If on the very rare occasion in London that we do open fire, that individual officer will have to account for his or her actions, knowing that their actions will come under intense scrutiny for many weeks, months, and sometimes years through independent investigation or even inquiry. And that's very stressful for officers and their families. It is clearly demanding and clearly dangerous. Absolutely. Our officers who crew the armed response vehicles attend incidents not knowing what they're going to face when they get there on the majority of occasions. So our officers put themselves between the public and danger in order to protect all of London's communities. The scene where Lee Rigby died and the barracks here have become focal points for people to leave messages of condolence. Most of the people who've come here didn't know Lee but they felt the need to mark his death. 
This is a murder that's touched the nation. Lee Rigby had served in Afghanistan, but he died while off duty on a London street. Rest in peace, Lee. We loved you so much and you didn't deserve this. You fought for your country and did it well. You will always be our hero. We are just upset you left us so early. We love you, Lee. Good night. Well, for more on the investigation into Lee Rigby's murder and the broader fears of more terror attacks to come, Matthew's also spoken to the Met's assistant commissioner, Mark Rowley, their head of specialist crime and operations. In terms of policing, are we now facing a new kind of terror threat, do you think? The motivation and detail behind um, last week's events are, are still being investigated, but um, the nature of, um, of, of terrorist threat and that can be very broad. We only look around, need to look around the world at different events that have taken place to see there's a wide range of tactics and methods involved, and we need to be training ourselves and ready to respond to all of those. There was something about the um, attack on one individual which is um, particularly focuses the mind and um, is particularly, up, particularly upsetting. Um, so we need to go back to our plans, go back to our thinking. Our professional response to that needs to be, um, have we covered every eventuality we can think of? Is our training right? Is there anything we can improve upon? Is there anything we need to get, um, get fitter and more prepared for? How do you ensure, how do you police that what happened doesn't lead to social division, tension within communities? The vast majority of um, community leaders, individuals, the local community um, leaders, particularly around Woolwich, have been um, very constructive, and that's, I think that's been really positive and striking. Um, but you do see people who are looking to cause um, mischief and spread division and tension. And there have been incidents, things. haven't there? So you must be aware of, of the potential danger. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely. So on the one hand, you've got a, a, a small um, increase in the number of sort of hate crime, sort of um, racist graffiti, attacks on um, places of worship. Um, not big in number, but the symbolism after last week is striking to communities and we will um, bear down on that and bring people to justice as quickly as we possibly can do. Eight days on, it is still profoundly shocking, isn't it? Uh, it's an awful and shocking event and we're still, whilst the investigation continues, we're still working with communities to deal with the consequences for them and we've got officers who are um, reflecting on what they've dealt with and what they're dealing with now and it, it is shocking to them as well. And of course this is very much an ongoing investigation and police continue to appeal for more information. They want to hear from anyone who saw a blue Vauxhall Tigra in the area at the time or indeed anyone who witnessed the attack. If you filmed or you took photos of the incident then please do email them to the address that's on the screen now or you could call the anti-terrorist hotline 0800 789 321 is the number for that. Right, now it's over to Martin for the first of tonight's Wanted Faces. Detectives from Hertfordshire urgently need to trace this man, John John Boy Ward. They want to speak to the traveller, who's 32, in connection with the murder of his second cousin, Thomas Ward, who was shot at the door of his caravan in front of his wife and newborn daughter. And this happened in Stevenage five weeks ago. The three men involved in the shooting are thought to have been driving a stolen white Audi S3 with the cloned plates RV59HSK. CCTV cameras just over a mile away from the shooting recorded what police believe the stolen Audi along with a white Vox, Volkswagen Golf, which is also thought to be involved. Now, this footage shows them approach a roundabout in convoy ten minutes before the murder. The same two cars are seen again going in the opposite direction around three minutes after it took place, with the Audi later found abandoned seven miles away. Now, police don't know if John Boy Ward was there when the shooting took place, but he may still have vital information. What detectives do know is that around half an hour after the murder, John Boy left his home in Hatfield in a black Mercedes C250. This car was then captured on CCTV in Barnet in North London just after 1 a.m. Twelve hours later, John Boy is seen at a bank in Cockfosters in the city, where he withdraws £3,000 in cash before catching a Eurostar train to Brussels. Police believe John Boy Ward may well be with his pregnant wife, 21-year-old Jolene Josie Ward. She also left the country two days after the shooting. 
Detectives need to trace both of them urgently. So if you have any information about them or the shooting itself, please get in touch. Next, a charming pair of drug dealers. David Terence Hewson on the left and Liam Mark Johnson on the right have both been convicted of conspiracy to supply almost £150,000 worth of cocaine. They were sentenced to 11 years each in their absence after they failed to turn up at court. Hewson, who's 31, and Johnson, who's 33, both have Liverpudlian accents and links to Spain. Detectives believe the pair may well be together. They're both very dangerous, so if you know where either of them are, call 999 now. Finally, for now, is John Archer Barnett. He also uses the surname Owen. He's a convicted paedophile who's failed to register his whereabouts with the police in breach of his terms of release. Barnett's described as having a beer belly and tattoos of eagles on both forearms. He often uses a hearing aid and one side of his face droops slightly as a result of a stroke. 63-year-old Barnett has links to Essex, Kent, London and Dorset and has previously lived in Wales. Now, this picture was taken a few years ago, and detectives think he may have shaved off his beard and hair to alter his appearance since then. All of tonight's faces are on the website, and if you know where they are, please call 0500 600 600, or you can text 63399, type crime, leave a space, and then your message. Now to an unusual and disturbing sexual assault on a woman. She had stopped off for petrol early one evening, back in February, when a man armed with a knife forced his way into her car and made her drive off before attacking her. Police are convinced that he's going to do this again. Get out of my car! Drive! Oh my God! In February, a young woman stopped at this garage in Dunstable to buy petrol. Surrounded by other customers, there was nothing out of the ordinary. We've reconstructed the shocking events of what happened next, based on the statement she later gave to police. Her words are spoken by an actor. I went to the petrol station, paid and came out. <laughs> Once I got in the car, I put my purse and everything onto the seat and went to drive off. As I got to the ramp, I was just looking at the traffic on the main road because I was edging out to turn right onto Pointers Road. And that's when I could see a man in a black jacket coming towards my car. No! Oh, my God! Drive! He motioned for me to go left into Emerald Road. As I went down Emerald Road, he was pointing to all the quiet off-roads. I just kept thinking that I had to get to a main road, so I carried on going. And he was getting angrier, pulling my hair, and he held the knife. We turned right. He wanted me to pull up in the little lay by there, so I did. It was here, on Tomlinson Avenue, that the hooded man sexually assaulted his victim. But despite the danger, she did everything she could to try to attract the attention of anyone nearby. I turned the music up. I was trying to beat my horn and make it look like an accident because he was getting angrier. The last thing I'd done was... <laughs> I turned the light on and he got really angry. I grabbed for the knife and I managed to get the handle and I just thought, if I don't let go, he can't hurt me. Nothing's gonna happen here. Get out of my car. Uh. No, police. Won't call the police, promise. Phone. Take my phone, take my cash, take my purse, take my car, just go. Sorry. And then he got out of the car. Sorry. Then he closed the door. And I drove off. Now, crucially, the start of this attack has been caught on camera. What does the footage actually show? 
Yes, we've got CCTV from the petrol station on Pointers Road, and this shows that the offender tried to get into another vehicle before he attacked our victim, but the drivers managed to lock the passenger door, and uh, he backs off, crucially, again, a lone female driver. He doesn't go away, though. He waits on the corner, and the next vehicle to exit has two people in the front seat. He makes no approach to this, and a short time later, the next vehicle to try and exit the petrol station is our victim's car. Again, she's alone in the car, and he takes his opportunity and makes quite a confident approach. Um, and you can see here, he knocks on the window, but is in the car really before she's had a chance to do anything. And you'll see here the car rolls back a little bit. By now, he's pulled a knife on her. He's grabbed her by the hair and really has control of her within a couple of seconds. It's incredible just how brazen it is. Yes, and where he takes her is also a public place. Tomlinson Avenue is an open residential street. It's on a bus route, and the victim's vehicle parked up is captured on CCTV from buses travelling up that street. This is crucially when the attack was taking place and when our victim was fighting back. It was a very cold night, but people were out and about, and passengers on the bus. It may be that people on that number 38 at about 7.15 may have seen the offender get out of our victim's vehicle, and if so, please contact us. To take so many risks, I suppose, underlines just how dangerous this man is. He has taken a lot of risks, and that suggests to me that he will try again. Oh, my God! As soon as I saw the knife, I thought he was going to kill me. Without any doubt in my mind. I could imagine him stabbing me with that knife. I just felt so scared. It's really horrendous, isn't it? I'm joined now in the studio by Detective Inspector Bruce Doddsworth, who we saw in the film there. The victim has given you a lot of really important information. Somebody out there surely is going to know who this person is. Yes, Kirsty, this was a serious sexual assault, but the victim has bravely given us a good description and she's helped us put together this artist's impression. Now, the man is about six feet tall and of slim to medium build. Um, he's got olive skin and possibly short stubble on his face. He did speak with a foreign accent. Now, this may be Italian, though it's difficult to say for certain. And you can see from the CCTV that he's wearing a dark hooded jacket and quite distinctive trousers and boots. The trousers have fluorescent marks on the outside of each leg and they're different on either side. Yeah and would urge anyone who recognises this man or recognises his clothing to call us tonight. Yeah, distinctive clothing there, as you say. Mm. He, he took the victim's phone? He did. This was an HTC model, and it was in a purple phone case like this one. Um, we haven't recovered it, and the knife that was used is also still missing. Its blade was about five inches long, and it was smooth, um, and the blade was bent during the attack. Anyone who's seen these items dumped anywhere or knows someone who had them needs to get in touch. OK, those are the things he took then, it, but he did leave something. He left uh, important clues at the scene. He did. He left um, an unopened uh, flavoured condom packet in the front passenger seat. Now, this is made by a company called Startex, and we now know that it was only sold in outlets in Belgium from December last year. It wasn't sold in the UK. If anyone knows someone who has this brand of condom, then we need to hear from them. Yes, that's for sure. Um, CCTV, this could be really important. Tell us about this potential witness. Yes, this man was seen on cameras walking up Tomlinson Avenue in Luton and then turning right into Beadlow Road at about the time that the offender would have been getting out of the victim's car. A man who we believe may be the same person was later seen in uh, Lucy Park. He could have vital information that would help us. OK, this guy needs to get in contact with us tonight. Ruth for nice, thank you very much. So, this guy, this very dangerous man, is still out there. He must be found. Can you help us do that tonight? If you can help, please, I would urge you to call our studio now. There's the number. It's 0500 600 600. And, of course, if you've been a victim of crime, you can always call the victim support line. Let me give you their number. It's 0845 30 30. 900. Right, time for some crimes caught on camera now, starting with a violent assault in Bristol, which happened in January. It's the early hours of a Sunday morning, and two men are running around the city streets. They seem in high spirits, messing about, laughing, and chatting to other people who are around. 
the pair continue their nighttime stroll. And a few minutes later, they're captured standing by a cash machine, where one of the men, wearing a sandy-colored coat, becomes involved in an argument with a man in a dark top. Now, it all happens at the edge of the shot, but you can see how the row escalates as the man in the coat lunges at the victim, a single punch knocking him out. The attacker and his mate run off. That blow caused a bleed on the victim's brain, which needed surgery. Name the man responsible tonight. A man in a woolly hat and rather fetching glasses gets on board the number 242 bus in London on a Sunday morning last November. He makes his way to the back, where he takes a seat. By the time the bus reaches the depot, the man in the hat has moved to a seat next to the window, where he's fallen asleep. One of the depot workers gets on board and tries to wake the sleeping man. When he comes round, the dozy passenger becomes aggressive and starts shouting at the guy in the high-vis jacket. In the commotion, he almost loses his trousers. Nice pants. But the attacker suddenly lashes out, punching the victim in the face, even standing on one of the seats as he tries to overpower him. The pair grapple before the attacker finally runs off. The victim suffered serious injuries to his face and back as a result of the attack. Make it the end of the line for this thug. Tell us, who is he? Widnes Town Centre on a Friday afternoon last August. A man wearing a baseball cap and carrying a green plastic bag is walking up and down the busy precinct. After a few minutes, he stops outside a branch of the Santander Bank. As he walks in, he rummages around in his bag and pulls out what looks like a handgun before covering his face. He then walks up to the counter and points the weapon at the woman behind the desk and demands she hand over money. However, the cashier is able to activate the counter's safety screen and the man is forced to flee empty-handed. We're banking on you naming this gun-toting would-be robber tonight. Lots more CCTV still to come and you can see it all again on the Crime Watch website. Call 0500 600 600 if you can help or text 63399, type crime, leave a space and then your message. Right now, though, it's time for some of this month's other crime news. A 22-year-old man being questioned by police about the disappearance of teenager Georgia Williams has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Well, for the latest, we can go to Sean Lloyd, who's in Wellington for us. And Sean, what is the latest? Well, the latest is that Georgia Williams is still missing. Police are still looking for her tonight. They've examined a house here in Wellington and they've also been searching Woodland near Whitchurch. They've been at a number of rural locations right across Shropshire following information from the public. 17-year-old Georgia Williams was last seen leaving her family home in Wellington at 7.30 on Sunday evening. She was due to spend the night with friends. However, the alarm was raised when she didn't return. Her family is said to be devastated by her disappearance, which is totally out of character. What do you know about the man who's been arrested? Well, this 22-year-old man was arrested in Glasgow yesterday morning on suspicion of kidnap. He was then brought back to Shropshire and was re-arrested yesterday evening by detectives here on suspicion of murder. He's been named locally as Jamie Reynolds. Police are appealing for help. What specifically do they need to know? They really want the public's help um, with relation to sightings of a grey Toyota van registration plate CX06ASV. Now, this van was seen leaving Wellington on Monday afternoon. They're particularly concerned to get information about sightings of it in Wrexham at around 5 o'clock and Queensbury at 10.30 at night. They have details of those sightings. They really want to know what happened to that van. Where was it in the five hours between those two times? The van was also seen heading north. It was found in a car park in Glasgow and is now being examined by police. OK, Sean, thanks very much. Well, anyone with information should call the dedicated incident room on 0800 
0560944. Almost a month ago to the day, Mohammed Salim, a man in his 80s, was stabbed in the back whilst walking home from his local mosque. The attack happened in the small Heath area of Birmingham, just yards from his front door. He died within minutes. Mohammed Salim came to Britain with his wife Said in the 50s. He worked at a local baker's, retiring 15 years ago to spend more time with his growing family. My dad was granddad to 22 children with the 23rd on the way. The older ones are aware that, you know, their granddad's passed away, but the younger ones haven't comprehended that, yeah, they won't be seeing their granddad anymore. My daughter promised to build her a Wendy house as well. Um, so, you know, there's all these things that were planned and, you know, that's not going to happen anymore. Every day, Mohammed would visit his cousin, who runs a grocer's nearby. I miss him every single day. He used to come twice a day. And the day he happened, he was there, sitting next to me about same time, five, six o'clock, five to six o'clock, he was there. And he left, and I told him, see you tomorrow. And that tomorrow never come. A man of habit, and at 82, his life was uncomplicated. His routine would consist of him waking up in the morning, offering his prayers, staying behind in the masjid, meeting and greeting people before he would go home, stay with his family, and then come back for the, the, the next prayer. So this was a normal, typical day for Mr. Salim. And this is why it's more baffling for us as a community, as a congregation, to, to really try and understand or comprehend as to why this person was targeted. These pictures show Mohammed leaving after final prayers. From the mosque, it's just a few minutes' walk to his home. It's on the same road. Check for me and we need to know if he's breathing. Put your ear next to his mouth if you can, tell me if he's breathing. <laughs> Is he breathing? He's not breathing. Do you know how to do CPR? Uh, no, I don't. I want you to lay him flat on his back. Keep doing this until help arrives. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Carry on. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Keep one, going. Two, three. One, two, three. One, Tell me when you can see the ambulance. Two, three. One, two, three. 
the weapon used on Mohammed punctured a lung, causing massive bleeding. He died within sight of his own home. He was 82 years old, you know, attacked from behind, um, stabbed brutally and killed. There's no way he could defend himself. He always used to have sweets in his pocket, walk on the street, a few kids are there, like, you know, give them a few kids are there, give them a sweet. Very, very friendly. He was a very peaceful man, he was. Every day he used to sit there. He used to put his stick here as well, walking stick. Yeah, he was a lovely, lovely person. Minutes after the attack, CCTV picked up this man. Police believe he may hold vital information. Identifying him could help solve this crime and give the family a chance to grieve. You know, we can't rest until we know, you know, who's done this and that that person has been caught and we can't bury our father until that's done either. We need to find out so that we can start to grieve properly as a family as to who did this and why they would do it in such a nasty and brutal way. Um, I know, you know, we've all got to die one day, but it's not somebody's decision to decide that, well, today, you know, I'm going to take that person's life away. Senseless. Well, joining me now is Detective Superintendent Mark Payne. It is really beyond belief what has happened here. A quiet man going about his business, clearly very well liked within his community. In that film there, we saw this CCTV. This could be really important. Tell us more. Yeah, this is a clip of CCTV uh, of a man running along Wincliffe Road, which is adjacent to the murder scene. Right. It's immediately or very close after the event, uh, and this man, uh, despite numerous appeals, has not come forward. Uh, this is somebody's brother, it's somebody's son, it's somebody's uh, friend or partner. We do need somebody to make that call to let us know who that in individual is so that we can trace them, find out what they were doing at the scene on the night. OK, that's essential. Um, we should tell people there's a big reward linked to this. Yeah, uh, we're working with Crime Stoppers. There's a £10,000 reward available to anybody who comes forward and gives us information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for the murder of Mr Saloon. OK, let's see what our viewers can do tonight. Mark, thanks very much for now. If, if you can help in any way, I'd urge you, please, do the right thing. Call our studio now, 0500 600 600. Or if you prefer, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Right, it's time now for a quick update on what's already come in on the phones. Here's Matthew. Yes, let's get the very latest on that sexual assault in Dunstable. Ruth Dodsworth is in charge of this investigation. And Ruth, what has come in? Yes, we've had a really good call with regards to the clothing that's been worn, and that's exactly what we need. I'm still very keen to hear from people about the clothing. It's quite distinctive. It's got those two different fluorescent marks on either side of the leg, and it's shown quite clearly on the CCTV, even though he gets into the car very quickly. Yes, we saw it again there. He's in and out uh, very, very swiftly there. You've had calls about similar incidents as well. Yes, indeed, and there's a lot we can do with those. It's, again, it's exactly what we need. One was at another petrol station not so long ago, and we'll be researching that. What about the phone, the knife, those other appeal points you were asking for? Yes, very keen to hear from people who've seen that knife or seen that phone. Someone must have seen those items at some point. And in terms of this man, I mean, you think he will do this again, don't you? Yeah, he is a dangerous man. Um, if anyone does recognise him from the description and the artist's impression, please call us. Ruth, I'll let you get back to the calls. Thank you. Thanks very much. Kirsty. Right, still to come tonight, Martin goes out on patrol with the robbery squad trying to keep a lid on the enormous rise in mobile phone thefts. The chap there has been detained. He's been essentially in the pub, dipping. So he's been wandering around, taking phones out of bags, taking wallets off tables, things like that. But before that, let's get some more wanted faces. Here's Martin. And we start with Stephen Kinchin. Detectives want to speak to him in relation to the rape and sexual assault of two young girls. The 50-year-old has links to Western Supermare, West Mercia, Cambridgeshire and Gloucester, although he may well have travelled to Turkey. Next is Teddy Simpson. Police need to trace the 51-year-old in relation to an assault on two police officers outside a bookie shop earlier this year where this image was taken. Simpson, who has a distinctive scar on his left cheek, which you can see more clearly in this photo, has connections across London. 
He's considered to be dangerous, so if you know where he is, call 999 immediately. Number seven tonight is Robert Mark Knight. Detectives want to speak to the 52-year-old in connection with a large-scale conspiracy to import and supply cocaine. Knight has links to the Brown Hill area of Warsaw, to London, Gibraltar, South Africa, and to the Estepona and Benidorm areas of Spain. Police think he may well be using a forged passport to travel in and out of the UK. And finally, we have Abbas Ali Moslemani. Moslemani, officers want to speak to Moslemani about a violent attack during which a man had a glass smashed over his head. 52-year-old Moslemani, who's Palestinian, has links to London and Oxford. Call and text on the usual numbers if you recognize any of these faces tonight. And of course, they're all online. Time for some case updates now, starting with an appeal from last month. Detectives investigating the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence were here, asking for more information on the teenager's stabbing on the 20th anniversary of his death. Given the passage of time, the response from viewers was remarkable, and the officer leading the case, DCI Clive Driscoll, is particularly keen to trace several people who made contact. One gave information about the suspect's movements on the night, one contacted a daily newspaper saying they'd witnessed the attack and another male caller said he was aware of the group's movements on the night Stephen died but wanted some more information. Someone also left a message today but not their number. Now Clive has arranged a special mobile phone number so those people can speak directly to him. It's 07539 943 181 so if that was you please Call in now and if you have any other information about Stephen's murder you can speak to the inquiry team on 0208 785 8310. Back in March we asked for your help following a fatal fire which killed a mother and her five children. Dr Saba Usmani, her three sons and two daughters all died as a result of the blaze at their home in Harlow in Essex in October last year. Well, last week, 19-year-old man from Harlow was arrested on suspicion of murder, attempted murder, arson and burglary. He's been released on bail until the 27th of June. We will, of course, let you know how that case progresses. Early last year, we asked for your help following the death of 52-year-old Andrew Heath from Worcester, who died when his home was targeted in an arson attack in December 2011. Andrew was trapped in his flat when wheelie bins were set alight outside his front door. Well, last week, 24-year-old Daniel Martin from Ronxwood in Worcester admitted Andrew's manslaughter. He'll be sentenced in July. Now, great news on a wanted face we featured way back in March 2010. Andrew Moran was wanted after he escaped from custody at Burnley Crown Court in 2009. In his absence, the 31-year-old Moran from Salford was convicted for his role in an armed robbery on a Royal Mail van. Well, earlier this month, Moran was arrested in a dramatic swoop at his luxury Spanish villa. He tried to escape again by clambering over a wall and a hedge, but is now in custody in Spain, where he's being investigated for a series of other offences. In 2011, we appealed for your help to catch the killers of teenager Negus McLean from Edmonton in North London. The 15-year-old schoolboy was murdered as he cycled to a friend's home with his younger brother. The attack was so violent, the blade of the knife snapped off in his body. Well, following the programme, there were several arrests and our cameras were there when one of the suspects, Bilal Lariba, was taken into custody. Well, just this week, Lariba, along with three other teenagers, were convicted of Negus's murder 18-year-old Lariba, 16-year-old Travis Bowman and 19-year-olds Tertian Edwards and Brandon Hamilton all received sentences of between 12 and 19 years. We know that two of those convictions would not have happened without your calls. An excellent result. And finally, you may remember this CCTV of a gang manhandling a huge reel of electrical cable which they'd stolen from a rail depot in Finchley Road, North London in July 2012. Well, a police officer watching recognised the guy in the blue hooded jacket as 28-year-old Neil Green from Camden in London. Earlier this month, Green pleaded guilty to the theft and was sentenced to 20 months in prison. Another one reeled in thanks to your calls. 
Now time for more CCTV, starting with a ram raid on a post office in Lancashire in January. It's just after closing time on a Friday evening inside the Hall Green post office. The female member of staff locks up and prepares to fill the shop's cash machine. As she goes into the back office, a stolen black Vauxhall Corsa, seemingly guided by two hooded men, pulls onto the pavement outside and reverses straight through the shop front. Two men then rush into the post office while the driver waits outside. One of them threatens the terrified cashier with a sawn-off shotgun before he and the second robber grab cash boxes from the machine. They jump back into the waiting Corsa before speeding off. They stole more than 28,000 pounds. And incredibly, it seems this isn't the first time they've done this. Detectives think these raiders were responsible for another robbery at the same shop in November 2011, which we asked for your help with last year. In that attack, a female cashier was assaulted as she locked up also on a Friday evening. As the robbers fled, they shot a 65-year-old man in the leg. These men are dangerous and need to be stopped. They may have their faces covered, but someone knows who they are. Tell us tonight. Inside the spa store in Pensby in the Wirral on a Monday evening in March. Two women members of staff are behind the counter when a gang of four men bursts into the shop. Three of them are dressed in the standard black hoodies, but one is a tad more original, sporting a flat cap and scarf combo. They order the women to open the store's safe, but they explain they can't. Two of the gang then get behind the counter and help themselves to the contents of the tills, as well as emptying the shelves of more than two grand's worth of cigarettes. And the guy in the cap clearly has a sweet tooth as well as a stealing streak, helping himself to a large box of milk tray chocolates. The gang were in and out in a matter of minutes, taking their ill-gotten gains with them. Name the milk tray man and his thieving mates. Who are they? It's a Monday evening last November, and two women are working behind the counter of a bookmaker's shop, also in Merseyside. A man in a grey hoodie rushes in, brandishing a plank of wood. He swears at the cashiers and threatens to smash the glass. The frightened staff are forced to hand over cash. The robber then flees. Now, he may have only been carrying one, but he's as thick as two short planks if he thinks no one will recognise him. Name, please. All tonight's CCTV is online, and if you recognise anyone, please call and text the numbers on screen. Now, the chances are that you or someone you know has had their mobile phone stolen. It is a problem that's growing year on year, with hundreds now taken every single day. To see what's being done about it, Martin's been out with the specialist police units charged with chasing down the phone thieves. These muggers are targeting people for one thing. They can be violent or devious and strike in the blink of an eye. Almost all of us has one of these in our pockets. It's amazing how smartphones have revolutionized our lives. It's also very easy to forget quite how valuable they are. It's like walking around with 500 pounds in your pocket. Little wonder then that they become a bigger than ever target for muggers and pickpockets. Whilst overall crime figures are down, instances of mobile phone thefts are up by 15%. In London alone, on average, 314 phones are stolen every single day. Last month, Danny Walker from Putney was on a train home after a night out when a mugger struck. The attack left him with severe facial injuries. I'd have my phone in my hand to sort of check the time, and uh, then sort of, it's all very blurry. I think he said, give me your phone and wallet. I got sort of pushed up against the window, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and he sort of grabbed the phone from my hand and sort of then just started hitting me. Didn't really know what was happening. I was adjusting to being woken up. I was adjusting to someone grabbing my phone and then I was adjusting to someone hitting me. For a cheap, very battered kind of work, Blackberry, the sort of level of the 
crime and sort of the way I was punched doesn't quite equate to what he got out of it. Sadly, stories like Danny's are becoming increasingly common. In response, police forces up and down the country are sending out specialist patrols like this one to help people who are mugged for their mobile phones. I spent a few hours with the plainclothes team in South London as they roamed the streets responding to robberies. And what sort of success rate do these patrols have? When we target an area, um, even if we don't arrest anyone, it's, we do, you do see a reduction in it because they see us maybe being around here and it puts them off. Our presence is a massive deterrent. We've been called to a pub in Waterloo where a member of the public has reported a man rummaging through people's bags. We'll go and see what's happening. The chap there has been detained. He's been essentially in the pub, dipping. So he's been wandering around, taking phones out of bags, taking wallets off tables, things like that. But it's not just a problem here in London, it's national. In Sheffield, thieves are targeting people out on the town, enjoying themselves. Our cameras have been given access to an undercover police operation, tracking down the organised criminals, taking advantage of unsuspecting clubbers. Welcome to tonight's briefing for Operation Creep. Um, obviously for tonight we're looking at sort of licensed premises, offences taking place inside uh, and also outside as well. While plainclothes officers mingle inside, others in uniform lie in wait outside. And halfway through the shift, they're called to a city centre bar. Uh, we've just had information from a plainclothes pair of officers that have got a male acting suspiciously. He uh, appears to be on his own. He's stood with a jacket over one of his hands. Uh, they tend to use this technique because it sort of covers quite a lot of hand movement, allows them to potentially slip it into a handbag or into someone's pocket. By the time they arrive at the scene, a suspect has already been stopped. And when he's searched, they find three phones. Phone. Okay, does this have a pin lock on it? Unlock that phone. You don't have to get into that phone. Okay, but it's your phone. I'm arresting you because you cannot identify or get into this phone. You say it's your phone, but you don't know the passcode to get into it. Uh, the guy who's been arrested has just sort of left the club, quick sharpish. And it's at that point then we've put a follow on and we've stopped and searched him. Um, he doesn't know the passwords and can't identify anybody on the, on the phones, who they are. Um, so at this time he's under arrest on suspicion of the theft of telephones. After the thief had been arrested, the phone's real owner called her own number. And despite it being 3am, police were able to reunite her with her mobile. Had my phone on me the whole time, was sort of checking it. Um, had my bag closed the entire night, but uh, when I looked, it was open and the phone wasn't in it. And unlike the thief, she was able to unlock it. There we go. It's definitely your phone then, isn't it? Yeah. It was just really relief because it happened so quickly as well. So that was pretty lucky. But the vast majority of stolen phones are not returned. The National Mobile Phone Crime Unit searches houses all over Britain on a weekly basis. I brought up with some police, we'll have a word. And at this early morning raid, they're looking for a stash of stolen handsets. We do this day in and day out. So it is um, a problem that we're addressing every single day. Tell us what you found. Well, we found evidence that they're using uh, auction sites, online auction sites. This investigation, we're probably looking at over £25,000 worth of phones being traded over a couple of months. And very easily, they can do it online with what they think is complete anonymity. But that's not the case. Mobile phones are probably the easiest things to track down. Every day in the UK, hundreds of people have their phones stolen. Thieves are always on the lookout for an easy steal, so don't become their next target. No, don't. DCI Bob Mahoney that you saw there in the film from the National Mobile Phone Crime Unit is here with us. I mean, it was a great result for that young student. We should tell people she has changed the PIN number that we saw on screen there. Um, not so great for Danny Walker. Um, let's take another look at that awful CCTV of him being mugged and attacked for his phone. What can you tell us? Sure, this was an attack at 5.45 in the morning on the 13th of April on the train going from Waterloo to Putney. 
Uh, Danny received some serious injuries as a re result of this attack. Uh, we know that other people were there witnessing it, uh, but we've also got a really clear image of the attacker's face. Now, you are working on this with your team all around the country. Sometimes it's gangs, sometimes it's just a random individual working on their own, is that right? That's right. We deal with cases such as Danny's case, and we also target organised criminal gangs who are stealing mobile phones. Now, people may think it's a trivial thing to buy a stolen phone because it's cheap, but you just go look at some of the films tonight and see that some of the victims have got really serious, significant injuries. Yeah, really serious. Um, what can we all do then? Because we're all walking about with these very valuable things in our bags, in our pockets. What can we do to keep them safer? A couple of really simple measures. As the girl in the film, put your PIN code on your phone or, or password protected. If you've got a tracking application on your phone, make sure that it's activated. We can track that phone very simply then. You can also register your phone for free on the National Property Register via a website called immobilize.com. And that's all free. More importantly, though, don't become a victim. Make sure your phone is safe. And before you get it out to use, just make sure that no, nobody's going to be around that's going to be stealing the phone off you. Yeah, and you were telling me earlier, 60% of people do not pin protect their phone. Do put it on your phone. Yeah. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, um, if you can help identify that man who attacked Danny, it was terrible. Please call now. The usual number, 0500 600 600. There are, I'm afraid to say, lots more cases of mobile phone robbery which need your help. They're all on our website. Right now, though, it's time for a last update on the phones. Here's Martin. Well, the very first face we showed you in the Wanted Faces was John Boy Ward, wanted in connection with the murder of his second cousin. We've had lots of calls and texts regarding this gentleman, including sightings of him in Hertfordshire, Northampton and Hatfield. These are being checked as we speak. Wanted face number four, John Archer Barnett, convicted paedophile, failing to comply with the conditions of his registration. Lots of texts and calls and emails about him, placing him in the same area of Kent. Those also are being checked out. And the CCTV footage we showed you in Bristol of that assault. Several calls, including two, giving exactly the same name. Keep them coming in. OK, that's everything for now. But remember, all of tonight's reconstructions, the CCTV, the wanted faces, all on the website. It's bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can also stay up to date with how the cases are progressing via Twitter, of course. Follow at BBC Crime Watch. The phone lines are going to stay open until midnight tomorrow. We're going to be back again tonight, of course, 10.35 after the news, with the very latest on what you've seen so far. We will also have a new appeal on the murder of a pensioner in his Bedfordshire home. More on that later. Also, you might want to know that the Crime Watch Roadshow is coming back. It starts a week on Monday, is on every weekday at 9.15 in the morning for a month. But for now, from everyone here, thanks for your calls. They do make a difference. Bye-bye.